1 through 4. When you found it, you would discover these words. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Because his mercy endureth forever. Let Israel say, his mercy endureth forever. Let the house of Aaron now say, his mercy endureth forever. Let those who fear the Lord now say, his mercy endureth forever. Father God, we thank you now. We honor you. We praise you. We magnify you. God, we thank you for another privilege. Lord, you provided us another chance. Lord, we don't deserve to be here. We don't deserve to be who we are or where we are. But God, you've given us another opportunity. And for that, Lord, I thank you. Lord, we come to the house of prayer with prayer on our hearts, with prayer on our mind. With you being the focus, Lord, we thank you, Lord, for giving us another opportunity. God, we come now to bless your name. We come now to praise you. We come now to worship you. We come now to give you glory. For you are worthy. You are gracious. You have blessed us again, Father God. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless your Holy Spirit, that he will rule and super rule. That your Holy Spirit, Father God, will influence us. That your Holy Spirit, Father God, will move throughout the building. Father God, that we will realize your blessings. That we will realize our shortcomings. And we will realize, Father God, that you're just God all by yourself. And Lord, because you're God, we worship you. Because you're God by yourself, we praise you. Because you've given us grace and you've given us mercy to show up one more time, Lord. We just say thank you. Lord, all over this building, we, we honor you with our lips. We honor you with our hands. We honor you with our feet. We honor you with our mind. Lord, we say hallowed to your name. For you are worthy, Lord. We praise you, Lord, for, for you deserve the glory, Lord. And we bless your holy name. Lord, we thank you for this privilege. We don't deserve it, but you've given it to us anyway. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for, for blessing us to be who we are and to come this far. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless the service. Bless the service, Father God, that the service will glorify you. Bless your word, Father God, that your word will be spoken and it will be clear. Bless your word, Father God, that your word will go about this day and that we will follow your word, Father God. That we will tell men, women, boys, and girls about the God we serve and that, Lord, you will make a difference. And, Lord, we ask you to keep the glory. All the honor and all the praise allow us to be beneficiaries of your many blessings. It's in the strong, mighty, powerful, anointed name of Jesus of Christ we pray. And we ask it all. Amen. 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 And thank the Lord.
praise our King, sir. The awesome and the mighty God. Let me call your attention to Psalm 118. Psalm number 118, verses 5 through 9. In the Old Testament, the book is Psalms. The number is 118. The verses are 5 through 9. Psalm 118, verses 5 through 9. When you found it, you would talk, you will find these words. I called on the Lord in my distress. The Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. The Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What man can do to me? The Lord is with me among those who help me. Therefore, I shall see my desire on those who hate me. It is better to trust the Lord than to put trust or confidence in man. It is better to trust the Lord than to put confidence in prince. I want to talk about God is for us. God is for us is for us. Last, last week I said to you that that God is with us. Today I want to say to you that God is for us. Amen. I said to you last week that because God is with us, we can do great things. Some writers have said well that God can move mountains. Jesus says that if you have as much faith as a mustard seed, yes. you can speak to your mountain, and your mountain has no choice but to jump, skip into the sea. Yeah, it's good to know that God is with us. And it's even better to know that God is for us. The psalmist today declares that not only is God our helper, he is for us. Amen. Look at how the psalmist began, and, and the psalmist began the same way that Jesus says we ought to begin our prayers. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6 that when you pray, you ought to begin like this. Our Father, identifying who God is. Jesus says when you pray, you ought to begin by recognizing your father and you ought to understand that you're not talking about your earthly father. For he says when you begin to pray, you ought to say, our father who art, art in heaven, who is in heaven. And then he proceeds to say, hallowed be thy name. The psalmist begins that same way because the psalmist declares that we ought to praise him. We ought to worship him. Yes, sir. I said to Sister Whitlock, Sister Davis didn't do the praise justice with her tamarind. <laughs> Brother Whitlock should have got his family members to come to Bible study today. All right. <laughs> From the Holiness Church. And they would have been running, they would have been jumping, they would have been climbing walls, they would have really been playing this tamarind. That's what the psalmist talked about this morning. The psalmist, the psalmist declares, just as Jesus says, we ought to begin our prayers by saying, hallowed to your name. Lord, we magnify you. God, we glorify you. God, we praise you. We, we honor you for just being who you are. Forget about what God has done. Just thank him for who he is. We serve the awesome, the amazing the awesome, the amazing God himself. Yes. When the psalmist, the psalmist says, all give thanks to the Lord for he is good. Yes, sir. We ought to thank him. The, the, the other day the boy said, every time I think of God, 
in what God has done, I have to thank God in how God has done it. He says, he says, all give thanks to the Lord for he is good. If you're breathing on your own, God is good. If you're walking on your own, God is good. If you're seeing on your own, God is good. When we look at the text, the text declares that when the Israelites were shut down and they were exiled, they were still thanking the Lord. But I want to put a point here and let you know today that in the midst of your distress, in the midst of your troubles, in the midst of things that's going on around you, you ought to stop for a minute yes, sir. just to be thankful unto God. This word thanks, this word thanks come from the Hebrew word yada, means that we ought to give him a, a yada praise. This word yada, this yada praise ought to be one that we shoot or aim at, in the direction of God. It is when no one else deserves praise, God deserves it. It is because regardless of what condition you're in, you're yet able to thank him. You ought to thank him because he's deserving of it. Is there anybody in the room today who knows that God is good? Who knows that his mercy endures forever? Is there anybody today who even on your worst day know that God is good? Even when the doctor gives you bad news, God is yet good. He says, he says, oh, Marion's dictionary, Noah Webster could not define the word oh. Because it's a deep-seated feeling deep down within it is when you have to cry out when you don't know what you're crying for. Yeah. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been there? I used to hear the seasoned saints talk about, talk about I was crying and didn't know why I was crying. I, I heard the joke the other day that said, my, my, my eyes are just raining. And it's because when you think about the goodness of God and all God has done for you, you don't have words. You can't put it into expression what God has done for you. So the psalmist says, oh. The psalmist declares, the psalmist declares that we ought to thank the Lord. And first thing he says that, that I'm thanking him and, and, and thanking him ought to become contagious. Yeah, 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 you ought, to, you ought to not only thank him, but your thanking God ought to become contagious simply because you ought to have an impression about yourself and about God, and the fact of the matter is, you ought to thank him for somebody else's evil. And you ought not have to be at the sanctified church for Thanksgiving to roll off your tongue. For thanksgiving to, to come into your feet. Uh, for thanksgiving to, to get into your hand. The, the psalmist declares that we ought to have a yada praise, meaning that we ought to praise him by throwing. It is the image of throwing a rock, or it is the image of throwing a stone, and therefore we ought to throw our praises unto the Lord. Who do you aim your praise? To whom do you aim your praise? Who, who do you think? Do, do you think Uncle Sam? Well, I just want to serve you notice in case you had, had noticed there are a bunch of folk on your check that you never met. There's a guy on there called Fiker. And he takes it before he gets to you. There's another guy on there that's called Medicare. And, and he takes it before it gets to you. There's another guy on there called Medicole. He takes it before it gets to you. And then, and then there's a girl on there called Social Security. And they take it so you cannot, you cannot thank Uncle Sam for what he is doing simply because Uncle Sam is taking and Uncle Sam is not giving. Right. So who do you think? Who do you who do you shoot your praises toward? Who do you gather your mouth and, and release a, a yada praise unto? He says, all oh, give thanks to the Lord. He says, give thanks to the Lord. He says, give thanks to the Lord. Give thanks to Jehovah God. The other day, Jehovah's Witnesses had the nerve, the audacity to tell me that I need to become one of Jehovah's Witnesses. I said to them, Brother Miles, I am one of Jehovah's Witnesses. 
I am because I am witnessing for the almighty God. I am witnessing for the self-existing God. And see, some people who say things and become a part of things, they don't know what they're a part of. So when you say you are Jehovah's Witness, you understand that you are witnessing to the almighty self-existing God. A God that was not created, a God that was not made, a God that was not sustained because he is God. And in the morning, he will be God. Before we got here, he will be God. When we leave here, he will be God. He is a self-existing, eternal God. And because he is God, we ought to praise him. We ought to honor him. We ought to magnify him. And he says that this God is good. Regardless of all the adjectives you can use, there's nothing better than just being good. <laughs> Regardless, you, you can say excellent, it, it boils down to being good. Right. You can say great, it boils down to being good. Amen. You can say honorable, it boils down to be good. There is nothing that compares and no one compares to Jesus Christ himself, to the self-existing God, the Lord himself. There is nothing that compares to him. He says he's good. And he says he's good because his mercy, his mercy endureth forever his his mercy his kindness has god been kind to you regardless of what you're going through has he been kind to you because regardless of how you see it the accident you had could have been worse the, the, the layoff you had could have been worse <laughs> regardless of what's going on around you it could have been worse but god's mercy stepped in and justice did not have his way See, the word, the word mercy means it's a good thing that God gives you when you don't deserve it. And so mercy is a twin to grace. So grace, grace is when God gives you what you don't deserve. He, he gives it to you when you don't deserve it. But mercy is when he holds back the bad that you, you, you should have had. Is there anybody in the room? Let me take a poll today. Is there anybody in the room, anybody listening to me who deserve to be here? If I was to testify today, I tell you, I, didn't, I don't deserve to be here. I messed up my last chance when I was two years old. I, I messed it up a long time ago. So God has not given me a second chance. He's given me another chance, and he's given it to me over and over and over again. This word mercy means pity. Word mercy simply means favor. I said to you before, I'd rather have favor then have money. Because I have come to the conclusion there are many people who have money and they don't have favor and they are out of their mind. There are people who have money who don't know what to do with it. There are people who have money that don't know what's going on around them because God has not kept them. But when God keeps you, when God gives you favor, you can get some money. <laughs> God, you ought to be praying, God, give me favor. Give, you know, give me favor. Give me, give me favor. Walk in before me. Walk out before me. Walk around me, Lord. Give me favor because when God gives you favor, everything else will come. So mercy is the favor of God. And the psalmist declares that it doesn't just exist for a little while. It exists forever. The character of God, he's, in, he's immutable, meaning that he never changes. He's always God. He's going to always be God. Uh, just the other day, somebody said that I'm separated from God. Well, God didn't move. God is still at the point he was sitting. He's still at the point where he was moving. And we need to make sure we join God where he's at work. God is looking. God is at work all around us. We need to jo join God where he's at work. God is at work all around us. He goes on to say, let Israel say, his mercy endureth forever. Now let me tell you, if anybody knows about mercy, it ought to be Israel. You see, Israel will make God a promise one minute and go against the promise the next second. And God, God will walk Israel, as you've seen, most, most of you have seen and heard through the Sunday school lesson, God released Israel from captivity 
And then when they hit a brick wall, when they hit some confusion, they start blaming the, the leader. That's just like us, isn't it? Pastor Davis knew not to do that. He, he knew he should have said that. He knew he should have handled things that way. Matter of fact, he should have left me in the ghetto where I was. He should have left me in slavery where I was. He did not have to bother my thing. And that's what we do. God performed one miracle after the other in their presence, and they began to thank God for it. But the moment they got to Mara and the, the water was bitter, they began to, to talk about God and talk about Moses. The moment they got to the Red Sea, they said, well, we had enough land and enough space. We had a place to bury our dead back in Egypt. Now you got us out here looking at a body of water. We have to get to a point where we understand that God's mercy exists forever. Israel has to say, and I want to tell you that, that our complexion has to say, God has been good. Yes. Our complexion ought to say that his mercy endured forever. Our complexion need to come to a point in our lives where we understand that God's mercy exists for now on. It goes on to say, let those who fear the Lord now say that God's mercy endureth forever. When you reverence God, when you respect God, when you approve of God, you understand really well that his mercy endureth forever. The psalmist says in our text today, I'm going to testify. The psalmist decides that I've told you that God's mercy will exist forever, but let me tell you how I know his mercy exists forever. He says in verse number five, I call on the Lord in my distress. And when I called on the Lord in my distress, the Lord answered me and set me in a broad place. Have you called on him lately? Have you just asked the Lord, Lord, I'm in distress right now. And see, all of us been, for the last two years, all of us have been in some kind of distress. I mean, we've been poor. I mean, preachers been poor. Churches been poor. Individuals been poor. Neighborhoods been poor. Employment and unemployment been pulling us. And that's why we can't brag about what we have because it will be gone in a heartbeat. You can't, you can't brag about your stuff. Matter of fact, the first thing you, can, you have to understand, you can't brag about your stuff, first of all, because the stuff you have don't belong to you. God has loaned it to you. you you're not the owner. You, you're just a manager. You're just a steward that God has allowed you to govern just for a moment. And sooner or later, your moment will be over. Parents get excited about newborn baby. Let me just share with you, newborn babies come with, with responsibilities. And not only how good that person is, not only how, how bad they are, you still have that responsibility. And that responsibility is only for a moment. So do, work, do well with your responsibility. Young people in school, education looks like it's a long way off. It looks like it's pushing you very hard. But as you receive your education, understand it's just around the corner. You'll be graduating. I said, graduate, not quit your way. I mean, graduate. I mean, hear your name called. I mean, graduate when, when family members can be invited to come and celebrate you. I mean, graduate. Children are falling out under pressure, under, under pure pressure. They're falling and fainting under the, the, the illusion that they got to be like somebody on social media. Don't you know that people on social media go to a place that they don't own? And they take pictures in places that they, they're not even renting? And they put it on social media to make you say that, ooh, I gotta be like them. And so children are passing out. Children are losing their minds in the midst of distress, in the midst of trouble, because they wanna be like the Kardashians. 
and we watching, we watching stuff on TV. We watching The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. Who wants to go through 25 to 30 folk and watch it all back on TV and say, you gonna marry me? Now the sisters can't see you in one more. And, and then say, oh, oh, she, she got to, he got to make his decision. We have to understand, distress is being put up on us by the pressure of social media, but we have to call on the Lord. The text declares, I called on the Lord in my distress, and the Lord answered me, and the Lord set me in a broad place. It says I called on him, and when I called on the Lord, he heard me. Yes, sir. Yes. I want to say to you today, keep praying, God hears you. Amen. Keep calling on him, God hears you. Keep spending time with him, he hears you. Regardless of how much trouble, regardless of how much pain, regardless if the walls are closing in on you or not, God hears you. Yes, sir. I said, God hears you. Yeah. It's a good thing to know that God hears you. And not only does he hear, as the psalmist says, he answers. Yes. The God we serve answers our prayer. See, we don't serve a God who has feet that can't walk, who, who has a body but cannot, cannot move it. We don't serve a God that's made of wood, hay, stubble, or metal. We serve a God who sits high and looks low. That's why we have to teach our children. We have to teach our children to pray and to call on God. All right, I, I, was, I was watching Family Feud. And I, I like to see Family Feud because I want to see who can think on their feet very fast. And one of, one, of the, one of the questions was, what are some of the things that parents teach their children? And as you think about it, what do parents teach their children? There were answers like cooking, fixing stuff. And I just knew they were going to say prayer. And one woman said prayer, and it wasn't up there. It tells us the type of people that they interviewed, and it gives us a snapshot of the type of people that's in America. Our children have to be taught to pray. They don't have to be taught to steal. They don't have to be taught to lie. I mean, it comes so simple. Children can dream up a lie in a split second. And then you ask them, why did you lie? They can't tell you. I just, it's just a good thing to do. I just thought it was time for them. But you have to teach them to pray. And you have to teach them to pray in a way where they can call on God. Call on God when you're not around. Call on God when things don't go right. Call on God when God is right there where you are. The psalmist declares, I called on the Lord in my distress. He heard me. The word distress means in pain and agony. I called on the Lord. He, he set me. He set me in a large, a broad place. He set me in an enlarged place. God is wanting to enlarge your territory. God is going to bless you in such a way that you haven't even thought of it. God wants to take you places and show you to people and to do things in your life, but you got to be honest about yourself and tell God where you messed up and tell God that I'm turning away from it and call on him. The other thing about this yard of praise, the other thing about blessing the Lord, the other thing about giving, giving God the praise is it's a verbal confession. And it doesn't matter how, how mild-mannered your personality is. You got to open your mouth and thank the Lord. Yeah. You, you have to open your mouth and, and give him a bitterest praise. I, I mean, a, a, a big praise, a love. You have to open your mouth. And you ought not wait until God bless you the way you want to be blessed. In your distress. The psalmist says, in my distress, I realize he's good. When things were going wrong, I realized he was good. When I, I had no help anywhere to be seen, I realized that God is good. He says, I called on him in my distress. God answered me, and he set me in a broad place. God will take you places and do things with you. Young man, young girl, 
There is more to, to, to this world than Houston, Texas, Third Ward, Southeast Houston, Missouri City. There is more to life than this. There, there is more to life than in your little neighborhood. One, one young man grew up in Third Ward. He got married at the age of 26 years old. And for his, for his honeymoon, uh, his, his wife had booked a honeymoon out of the country. Well, he had never been out of third ward. He had let, never, you know, they, they cleaned it up now. They, now they call it Midtown. But he had never been out of third ward. 27 years, 26 years old. Never been out of third ward. I'm not talking about the city of third ward. I'm talking about the ward third ward. I'm talking about the hood third ward. All he knew was the hood. Third ward or thug ward. All he knew was the hood. I want to say to the young people of this church, there is more to life than what you see. And, and life is different than what you know. You know, you need to learn to call on the Lord in the midst of your distress, in good times and in bad times, call on the Lord. And the Lord answered them. And the Lord will answer you. Now, you're never too young or you're never too old to call on the Lord because the Lord we serve is omnipresent. He's all places at the same time. He, he is everywhere. Matter of fact, while you're trying to sleep on me, he's here. He's in this place right now. Matter of fact, he's been trying to shake you ever since I stood up here. The Lord is present right now. Brother, brother went to, to the homeless shelter, Star Hope, and he was up teaching and, and, a, and a bunch of guys started falling asleep. And he said, hey, hey, wake that guy up over there. I said, man, don't worry about that. No, no, wake him up over there. He said, you wake him up, you the one to put him to sleep. <laughs> but God is present. And God is moving. God is alive. He's well. He's dynamic. He's always on the move. And he's stationary. He's everywhere at the same time. Everywhere God goes, he bumps into himself. He's present with you today. And he's for us. The summer says, he, I cried for him in the midst of my distress. He, he heard me. He answered me. And, and he sent me in a broad place. He put me somewhere I wasn't always. He put me in a big place. The question becomes, do you want to be a small fish in a big bowl or a big fish in a small bowl? When you're a big fish in a small bowl, what you have to understand, you don't have room to move. When you're a big fish in a small bowl, somebody will always be shooting for you. When you're a big fish in a small bowl, you, you're looking forward to being on top one day and you're climbing the ladder. Young people, if you're going to climb the ladder, climb it with God on your heart. Climb it with God in the midst of it. And when you're a big fish in a small bowl, many times you get stuck on yourself. And when you're stuck on yourself, God can't use you. You got to put yourself in a position where God promotes you and not you doing the promotion. Trust God. Trust him. Trust him. The psalmist declares the, the Lord is on my side. He says the Lord is on my side. Let me tell you, I can quit right here. If you can get this, I can quit right here. I can shut it down right here. He says the Lord is on my side. The psalmist declares that the Lord is on my side. The apostle Paul picks this up in, in Romans chapter 8. And he says, if the Lord is for us, who can be against us? It's a rhetorical question because we know the answer. If the Lord is for us, it doesn't matter who's against us. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter who's against us. It doesn't matter what, what life will give you. It doesn't matter what other people say. God is for us and God is with us. It's a good thing, Brother Nanlaw, to know that God is for us. It's a good thing to know that, that, that God is for you. God is on your side. The psalmist declares, the Lord is for me among those who help me. You can't depend on man. I mean, man means well. They, they want to do right. They want to make it happen for you. But man will forget about you. Man, man want to keep their promises, but, but man's promise will, will turn short and take a left turn on you. 
Man wants to be on your side and they will make sure that, that you will be one that they continue to think about. But guess what? Something came up last night. And man, well, why didn't you call me? Well, man, I didn't even have time to call you. Something came up. You can't depend on man because man will let you down. The other thing, Braylon, you can't depend on family because family will let you down. You can't even depend on teammates because they will let you down. The psalmist says, I will not fear. What can man do to me? What can man do to me? Dr. King, in his final days, he, he said to us, I may not get there with you, but we as a people will get to the promised land. He says, I fear no man. Man can only take our physical lives. God is the one that keeps us. The moment, the moment this body, the moment this body disappears down here, the moment the spirit is taken out of this body, I'm in the presence of the Lord. The Apostle Paul says it like this. He says, it, it doesn't matter. This present day suffering is not to be compared to the glory that is yet to be revealed in me through Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul says, so it really doesn't matter. If, 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 if I suffer, God is going to get the glory. And then he says, in absence from the body is the, in the presence of the Lord. What he's saying is, it really doesn't matter if I physically die down here, I'm going to be in the presence of the Lord. And then he, he, he lives and then he says, if I continue to live and man do me wrong, God has the last word. He is the final judge. Look at the text, the text of class, the text of class, he says, I will not fear, verse number six. What can man do to me? Verse number seven, the Lord is for me, among those who help me. God has a way of blessing other people to bless you. But I wanna tell you today, you need to be a blesser. Because the more you bless, the more he blesses. The song back home they used to sing in the, in the country on the 16th section church, they used to sing during often time, you can't be God's gift, no matter how you try. The problem is people wasn't trying and because they wasn't trying, the songwriter had a little thrown off he, because he took for granted that people were trying to be God given. I want to tell you today, you ought to try being God's gift. The more you give, the more he gives to you. That's right. You can't beat God's giving. That's right. No matter how you try, you can't beat. So he says, the psalmist declares that the Lord is with me and he's among those who help me. God uses everyday men and women, boys and girls, to bless us. You don't have to wait on, on lightning to strike. You don't have to wait on God to jump down from heaven. He uses everyday people to bless us. As I look around this room, as I look around, if I needed a million dollars, I got two over there, two over there, two over there, two hundred dollars back there. And then when I got short, I got Brandon Davis to give me all. All I need. I can just walk there and say, hey, brother, this is what I got. I need, I need this much more. He said, oh, no, no problem, Pastor. And he walked around with it in his pocket, too. God has a way of blessing people by using people. And God is among those who will help you. In the midst of your distress, God keeps you sane. He hears you, he answers you, and he helps you. Therefore, I shall see the desires of those who hate me. Therefore, I shall see my desire on those who hate me. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay, says the Lord. The Lord will repay every man who misuses you. You know, our, our, our government is really messed up. I mean, it's, it's really, I mean, it's really, I, let me just tell you, I know it's a secret, I know you don't know this, our government is really, really messed up. And there, there is one man, and maybe three in here in Texas, and one man nationally that's, that's continuing to mess it up. And it looks like they're getting away. It looks like they're just dogging us out. 
It looks like the lieutenant governor is just doing this thing. He's he just doing it anyway. It looks like the governor is just doing whatever he wants to do. It looks like the former president is just having his way. But I want to tell you, God is not asleep. And God will deliver. And when God delivers, God will bless us in the midst of it. And God has a way of blessing us in the midst of it, and he will allow us to see it come to pass. That's right. That's right, Pastor. Psalmist says in Psalm 37 that he cut them down like grass. <laughs> the, 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 the psalmist declares that don't, don't even worry about fighting them back. He, he will cut down, cut down the wicked like cutting grass. Verse number 8 says, it is better to trust in God than to put confidence in man. It is much better to put your trust in God than to put confidence in man. Anybody been let down by man? Has anybody anybody got a promise of man and man didn't keep his promise? It is better to put your trust in God than to have confidence in man. He goes on to say, it is better to trust the Lord than to put confidence in princes. Let me just share with you. It doesn't matter what position they have. Doesn't matter how much money they have. Doesn't matter how much prestige they have. It doesn't matter how, how much clout they have. Put your trust in God. Keep calling on God. Keep depending on God. And whatever you do, keep praising him. We ought to praise him. We ought to honor him in our distress. We have to call on him. And let me tell you, praises has a way of getting man's attention. And praises has a way of getting God's attention. And the psalmist declares, we ought to praise him and thank him for his mercy and do it forever. I want to say to you today as I, as I close my little message today. In your moments of distress, in your moments of suffering, in your moment of feeling defeat, know beyond a shadow of doubt that God is with you. That's right. And when God is on your side, it's more than anybody that can be against you. Oh, that's right. God is on your side. Put your confidence yes. in, in God. Put your trust in God because God is going to see us through. That's right. That's right. We're wearing masks in here. Two years ago, we didn't even think about it. The only time we saw a mask, we went to the doctor's office in the hospital. Now we're wearing masks. And, and then years ago, I would talk about hand sanitizer and how I should have created it because it's, it's everywhere you go. Now I really would have been rich had I created it. Some people had not bought not one single ounce of, of hand sanitizer, but now they can't move with that. They go to lunch and want some sanitizer. They open the door. You want some sanitizer? Let me tell you, you better put your trust in God. You ought to make sure that you do all the natural things that you need to do. Get your vaccination. Make sure you wear masks. Make sure you sanitize your hands. Uh, soap and water won't hurt every now and then. Because God will help us. God is with those who are helping us. God will bless us in our distress because his mercy endureth forever. And regardless of how many defeats we have had in the last year or two, God's mercy has come running. His mercy has come running. His, his mercy has overshadowed justice because if, if justice had had his way, we all would have been wiped out. But God's mercy is still holding us together. If justice, what we deserve, had had his way, God's mercy keeps us holding together. If, if, if justice had had his way, we none, none of us, let me just share, none of us are fit to be where we are, or have what we have, or be with who we are because of God's mercy. God's mercy has made a way out of no way. He did it through Jesus. Through his death, burial, and resurrection over 2,000 years ago. Jesus had mercy on us. He knew we would party all night. Jesus had mercy. He knew we would do our own thing. Jesus had mercy. He knew when we left church we would cuss like seaport sailor. Jesus had mercy. He knew that the thieves would steal, but even the thieves 
have the mercy of God. And God is saying, since I'm giving you one more chance, he says, come unto me, though your sins be as scarlet, the blood of Jesus will wash you whiter than snow. Don't you want God with you? Jesus died over 2,000 years ago so that God can be with you. They killed him. They laid him in a barn tomb. Joseph asked for permission according to Matthew chapter 27. Joseph had a brand new tomb. He asked for permission to pick up Jesus, his dead body, and lay it in his brand new tomb. Yes, he did. He laid it in his brand new tomb. He laid, his, laid him in a brand new tomb. But early that third day morning, he rose from the dead with all power in heaven and earth in his hand. If you want God with you, you need to receive Jesus, the Son of God. The door is open. The invitation is extended. You ought to come to Jesus just as you are. Believe in the story that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died. He was buried. And he rose from the dead. He did it for you and he did it for me. If you can trust that story to get to heaven, it will take you to heaven. If you're listening to me and you want to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, just bow your head to me and repeat after me and invite him in. Say, Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name, amen. We believe that if you pray this prayer when you are born again, we believe that when you die, you're on your way to heaven because it's this story and this story alone that can take you. There may be others who are, are caught in sin, who wrestle with sin. Paul says we all wrestle with it. We wrestle, we tussle. Every time we would to do, do good, evil is present with us. I want to pray with you. Lord, we ask you, Father God, to bless us. We ask you to forgive us. We ask you, Father God, to continue to walk with us. Bless us to repent. Bless us to redeem ourselves through Jesus Christ. Bless us, Lord, that we will be rededicated, recommitted to you, God, to your service, to your church, to your people. Lord, we thank you for saving us and thank you for blessing us. And bless us, Lord, to obey you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank God. There may be others who are without a church home or in between church homes. I invite you to join the New Beginning Church, whether you're far or near, whether you, whether you are local or whether you're global. You can join it. If you listen on our broadcast, you can join the New Beginning Church. Just inbox me and let me know. And we'll be glad to, to welcome you to the family of faith. Amen and thank God. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.